The ABC journalist has been covering this story since his award-winning report on asbestos for Radio National Science Report back in 1977. So he's been on the trail for a while. He joins us right now in the breakfast studio. Matt, welcome. Morning, Fran. Matt, your book lifts the lid on the breadth and the depth of James Hardy's deceit, the ongoing denials which led to literally thousands of deaths. Can we pinpoint, or have you been able to pinpoint, when did James Hardy know that asbestos killed? Well, put it this way, Fran. I mean, they first got sued back in 1939 for asbestosis. So certainly they were on notice at that point, and they had a, a string of company inspections by the um, health authorities around the country because um, in Britain there have been regulations passed controlling the use of asbestos. So it goes back until the 1930s. The cancer link was uh, um, developed somewhere around about the 1940s. The Germans knew about it, 1950s. They were certainly placed on notice. And uh, the mesothelioma, which is the particularly deadly cancer that was specifically identified as associated with asbestos, they knew about from the late 1950s, early 1960s. Just reading through your book, there seems to be a flurry of concern within James Hardy around the 60s, because overseas information was coming out about the impact. Yeah, absolutely. And by then, people were starting to drop. Um, it was really clear from the legacy of Wittenham, which uh, supplied a lot of hardy blue asbestos, or all of Hardy's blue asbestos, that uh, you didn't need very much exposure at all. And, you know, housewives who were washing um, their husband's overalls, uh, people who just lived next door to the factories were contracting mesothelioma. And it was something that uh, the James Hardy doctor pointed out. He said, look, people next door to the factory could be at risk. So James Hardy knew, but those people didn't know. This is the this is the great shame here. I mean, what did Hardy, what did James Hardy do about it? Well, they were making a lot of money. That's what they did about it. They kept making money. I mean, to argue that they took action the minute they knew is just ludicrous. Um, as as late as 19, I think it was 1983, 1984, James Hardy was making representations to our premier health authority, the National Health and Medical Research Council, to say, don't ban brown asbestos. We need it for our pipes. If you ban it, we'll have to shut down our factories. And... Uh, in, in the spirit of cooperation, our Premier Health Authority said, oh, OK, we won't. And that's, uh, that's clear in your book. The, uh, many of the health authorities for many years played ball with James Hardy. Hardy used to fly... You wouldn't have got away with this in, a, in, a, in nowadays where we have the internet and we all know what's going on around well, the world. Well, one hopes, but... one hopes. But you've got to remember, I mean, Hardy saw everybody coming. They knew about this stuff a long time before anybody else. So the unions, the health authorities, all of those people relied on Hardy to give them their information. I mean, Hardy wasn't a, a matter of complying with regulations. Hardy wrote the regulations. And... Talk about Hardy. The company's called James Hardy. It may as well have been called John Reed. Yeah, it's a lie. The name, like most of the things this company's ever done. Um, Who's John, John Reed? John Reed and the Reed family were the ones that got the company into asbestos. The real James Hardy died, or got out of the company anyway, in 1912. The company got into asbestos in 1916. And uh, there's another Sir James Hardy, of course, the sailor and uh, revered Australian whose son, uh, you know, gets extremely upset he's he's got a medical condition whenever these stories hit the deck and i said i ran into him at a, a drinks one time and i said you must hate john reed and he spun around we had a good conversation because the reed family made their family fortune out of asbestos um john reed we don't know about of course because he's out there as the revered philanthropist handing money out to charities and uh, and um, you know art galleries and the like and uh having buildings named after him and, and running up to Charles Sturt University to rename the uh, scholarship from the James Hardy Industries scholarship to the John B. Reed scholarship. But we do know that his name was on some documents back in the uh, the 60s and 70s, which made it clear that he understood that there were... Certainly risks. was, and there's no question about that. And I mean, one of the things I recount in the book is uh, Bernie Banton's trial, because Bernie like me, really wanted to see Reed to front up to court because this guy has never actually explained what his family did and what they thought. And I, I genuinely, I tried to approach him several times, had a brief conversation, several letters over this book, because if you've got 20,000, uh, an estimated 20,000 victims of James Hardy's asbestos, that's a third of our toll in World War I. You know, that's a huge number of Australians that have been affected by this company. Then I think the guy that ran the company for 23 years, during a time, I might add, Fran, um, because mesothelioma has a latent period of 40 years, 
the, the massive numbers of cancers that we're seeing now are as a result of exposures during his time, then I think he's got a duty to answer to those people.